Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter and it is 5.30 a.m. here in Inglewood, California. As you guys are tuning in, please let me know <clears throat> where you are and what time it is where you guys are tuning in. Um, happy to be here, honored, blessed, humbled, uh, just to be a part of your guys' day, whether it's live, whether it's replay, whether it's on the podcast, but um, just absolutely humbled. Uh, super thankful, you guys. We are approaching 200 days in a row. We're not quite there yet, but that is uh, the direction that we are heading. And um, it's beautiful, man. It is beautiful. Hundreds of people have been saved. We've got brothers and sisters from around the world that, uh, you know, gather here on a daily basis. And um, it is it is gorgeous. Just a gorgeous thing. Brother Carlos heading back. Heading back from... Uh, from where was he? He was in Chicago, right? Heading back to Denver. I love it. We got people from North Carolina, Germany, Riverside, uh, more North Carolina. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome in Alabama. Uh, brothers and sisters from around the world. I love to see it. Australia's in the house. Good morning, good morning. So, as uh, we're going to allow people to roll in at their own pace, I'm going to share before I pray. So I will do a prayer before we start our uh, devotions. Our devotions are in Second Thessalonians and Proverbs chapter 27. We got Aussies in LA. We got Sydney. We got Memphis, uh, Southwest Portland, my brother Cody Gardner, the Northwest baby. I love it. Northampton, England. Like, come on, man. God is moving. We know that God is moving, and it's uh, it's an absolute beautiful thing. Um, again, I said I am humbled to be uh, a part of a ministry that reaches around the world, and you guys are all a part of that. I don't want you to think for one moment. Uh, with your guys' badges, with your guys' subscriptions, with your donations, the things that you guys do, um, it helps. You're partnering with me preaching the gospel around the world. You guys afford me and allow me to do this full-time. Right to do this completely full time, uh, a pastor, uh, you know, here on coffee and prayer through all of the different avenues and things that I do, you guys allow that. So I just want to say a heartfelt thank you. I love you guys. I love you and I honor you. Yeah, Dallas is in the house. We got it. We got it. We got it. Philippines. Good morning. So thank you guys, man. Thank you. I appreciate you all. Um, as I was praying this morning, I'm sitting here. And there's just this overwhelming sense of peace and gratitude. Now, you guys might not relate to that because you could be going through something that seems like it's the end of the world. And um, I just wanted to share with you guys the heart posture uh, of where I'm coming from before I pray and before I start the scripture. But yesterday, yesterday is officially something I like to call Dude's Day, right? It, the, the weeks go, it goes Sunday, Monday, and then Dude's Day. Dude's Day is the day that we have our men's group. We have a men's group. It's worldwide. We've got about 78 guys in the group. And every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we have a men's Zoom meeting. And yesterday, I believe at the highest, there was about 24 uh, guys on there. So about a third of the guys showed up for our actual group yesterday. Um, it is a beautiful thing. But on top of that, before our men's group, myself, my brother Gonzo, and my brother Jalen, we all get together and we we pray, we go over, we read the word, we do Bible trivia, uh, and we do, you know, we kind of game plan and strategize and allow the Holy Spirit to lead the conversation. But even before that, my brother Jalen and I get together at about 10 in the morning. So yesterday, I left the house at 10 a.m. and spent about four or five hours with Jalen, praying, reading the word, creating content. Then we go to Gonzo's, we pray, we eat, we go over uh, scripture and we create content. And then we get to, we, we finish the night off with other brothers uh, from around the world on this Zoom call where we talk about uh, the, uh, the Lord and we share this book that we're going over. It's called The Manual. So it's officially Dude's Day. Um, it's a day for the boys, man. Tuesday is for the boys. Uh, DeAndre's there, Scott's there. Um, I absolutely love it. Uh, <laughs> you, you guys, Tama says, where's Bible trivia to? We filmed it yesterday. It has to be edited. It's going to take a minute. Um, I will most likely drop that on Friday. So please be patient. We did a couple episodes. So, um, fun Friday. We'll do Bible trivia back to my point, man. Dude's day is, uh, it, it was our very first one where we did that 10 AM all the way. I didn't get home till about nine o'clock last night, but 
Um, it was a lot to take in. Uh, God was evident. I spent an entire day preaching and talking and thinking about Jesus like most days, but it was just, it was surrounded by, by, you know, by ministering to men. So this morning as I was praying over it, I, I literally prayed for every single man in the Zoom last night um, by name. Uh, I took time just to, to pray over them, but God gave me this sense of peace. Because what I found in my own in my own life is many times I get caught up with the destination, right? I believe that God has a very special calling on my life. I believe that he has a special calling on everybody's life. But I know that where I'm at is not where he's taking me. I, I truly believe that he's taking me to a place. There is a vision that I dare not even share with you guys. There is something that he's written on my heart that he's doing with my ministry, with the ministry and the service that we're doing here. And I believe it's great. I believe it's a very, very big thing. Um, and, and sometimes for me, I get so caught up with the destination that I forget about the actual process. I forget about being present. I don't know if many of you guys can relate to that. Is God might have put in a vision, a dream, a goal on your heart, a destination, a place where you're going. It's not your arrival, but it is a place that he's going to take you. And what many of us do, and I'm speaking, I'm preaching to myself, is that... I get caught up with the actual destination of where he's taking me and, and what I, I know from confirmation from the Holy Spirit. He's saying this is where we're going. That I forget many times to stay present and to be thankful and grateful of the place where I'm at. Understanding that while I'm where I am, he's preparing me. Right? It is a process. He is preparing me in this place to to, to be effective and to develop the character that I will need when I get to that place. And so as I was sitting here, there was this peace that just overwhelmed me. Uh, this, this patience of just like, you know what? Right now, the space and the place that I'm in, God has me specifically where I am because there are things that I'm going to need that he is developing in me that I'm going to need when I get to that place. So if I were to leave right now and run to that place ahead of God's timing, I would be uh, ill-equipped. I would not be prepared and I would be lacking things in my character that I would need to be successful and to complete the mission in that place. So many times we want to fast forward. One of my favorite movies. Oh, here we go. Another movie. Um, a movie that literally brings me to tears every time I watch it. I don't need to hear your guys' opinion whether you like it or not. Um, it's a movie that I love. It's called Click. And it's by Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler is in this movie. It's called Click. And it's this idea of this man who gets so caught up with the idea of being successful and providing for his family. He receives this supernatural remote control. And what he does is he hits fast forward. And he typically fast forwards through some of the, the things and the, the, the times in his life to get to the bigger moments. And as he's fast forwarding, he's reaching these levels of success. But what he's realizing is that he's missing the most important things, the the sweet Swim meets with his daughter. He's missing the time that he spends with his family. He's, he's missing the time that he's with his wife. And even though he's hitting these checkpoints and he's fast forwarding through the day in and day out, the autopilot, right? The, the, he's fast forwarding through those things um, and he's reaching his checkpoints. He's missing the purpose and the preparation of life. So when he actually achieves these things, he's actually empty. He's lost. He's ill-prepared. And he looks back at the moments that he missed. And every time I watch that movie, uh, you know, I, I, I cry because I think that a lot of people live a life like that. They're willing to sacrifice their family, their children, these precious moments, these special times. They're willing to jump from achieving Achievement to achievement, accolade to accolade. They're willing to put their lives on autopilot and check out of some of the most important things just in order to reach these levels of success. And as I reflect on that movie, uh, amazing movie, I promise you it makes me cry every single time. Uh, as I reflect on that, I, I think how many of us uh, do that in our lives? How many of us are so focused on the destination or the next achievement, the next accomplishment, the next relationship, the next job, the next career, the next promotion, the next vacation, the next event that we are missing out on what God is doing in the present moment? Amen? Amen. So as I was sitting here 
thinking about that, it's just like, man, I am so thankful and grateful and filled with peace, even though not everything is perfect and I'm not where I want to be and I'm not at the place that I personally would love to be in my career. I understand that God has me here for a purpose and he's providing everything and he is surrounding me by these amazing men and uh, even women here on Coffee and Prayer and in our ministry. He's surrounding me by these amazing people. And the, the big thing is that, look, If I can't be faithful, I shared this yesterday, if I can't be faithful tending to this flock, if I can't be faithful on coffee and prayer, if I can't be faithful in my men's group, if I can't, if I'm overwhelmed, stressed out, beat down, exhausted, and I I can't tap into the strength of God to minister and take care of the flock that I have, why would God ever, ever give me more than that, right? Right? It's not his will that I be stressed out and spread thin. In fact, what he's doing is not only is he preparing me, but he's positioning people in my life who are going to run with me, right? I I, I watch, I I look at this uh, this men's group and I'm identifying men who have special qualities, who, uh, who really stand out and who are running in the same direction. They're loyal, they're faithful, they show up day in and day out, they're There's individuals who are investing in the ministry and what we're doing. They see the vision. They see what God has called us to do. And they're they're spending their time, energy, and effort trying to advance the kingdom of God. And it's like, um, I need to pump my brakes. I need to be more patient and trust that God's plan is greater than mine. And that uh, there's there's a pace. There's a speed at which he's advancing us. And it's our, it's, it's usually the thing that we like to do is we like to run ahead of God. And we're like, come on, God, like, with, you know, it's, uh, it's up here. And he's like, slow down. I'm preparing you. I'm positioning people. I'm putting things in place so that when you get there, you are fully prepared and ready for the task at hand. Right? It's powerful. It's powerful. So when I slow down, I sit in prayer, I reflect, I realize that God has me right where he wants me and he has you right where he wants you too. And that's the peace and the comfort that transcends all understanding because I can look at my life and circumstances and I can find reasons not to have peace. I can find reasons in my life not to have joy. I can find reasons in my life not to to, to feel protected or to feel disconnected. I can search and find reasons to be discouraged, frazzled, disappointed. I can find those reasons, but there's this peace that transcends understanding the world, the the knowledge of the world. I can find that peace because it comes from God, because I understand because he bought me and chose me and set me aside that uh, he loves me and wants what's absolutely best. So I just pray that that is a word for somebody out there. That was a word for me. And that was the word that God put on my heart as I was sitting in prayer before we got here. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. So let's pray. <laughs> and then we're going to jump into second Thessalonians. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the day of the Lord, right? The day of the Lord. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So heavenly father, we just want to thank you for today. We want to thank you for this scripture, uh, for the opportunity that we have to know you better, to know you deeper, to uh, have your truth revealed to us. God, right now we pray that you would prepare our hearts, um, that we wouldn't leave this place the same, that we are we are setting aside time, we are making you a priority, we are drawing near to you, and that uh, you know whatever your whatever it is that you want to show us or reveal to us, whatever it is that you want to speak to us, Lord, whether it's now or later, we pray that you would plant those seeds in our heart, um, that you would give us eyes to see that you would soften our heart so that the ground is broken up and that we are ready to receive your truth, uh, whether it's through challenging, whether it's through confrontation, whether it's through thoughts, uh, thought-provoking uh, issues and, and different scripture that really press us, stretch us, and help us to be more like your son, Jesus. And we pray this in his mighty name. Amen. And amen. That is what scripture is is here for. It's to to correct, to rebuke, to to inform, to educate, to challenge, um, and to change us. Right there, there's the scripture is there. It's not there just to tickle our ears. It's not there just to make us feel better about ourselves. It's not there just for motivational purposes. Scripture is truth, and the truth will not only set you free, but there should be. Uh, at times, uh, uh, scripture that challenges you, that presses you, that confronts you, 
Um, I know, and I always share this, when I came to Christ, there were thoughts, beliefs, opinions, and behaviors that I had in my heart and in my mind. And um, I had to change my opinions, thoughts, and behaviors. I'm not going to change the scripture to try to uh, fit my own personal agenda and my preference. It's not about my preference, right? It's not about my preference. It's about the truth. So when you run into scripture that challenges you or confuses you or, or presses you or stretches you, it's your privilege to dive deeper, to do research, to find context and to have a deeper understanding of why that is. What is it that's in you that is being challenged or that is being stretched or that is being confronted? Because again, right, the word of God is meant to change us. We're not meant to change the word of God, right? So in Second Th Thessalonians, uh, just to recap, this is the second letter to this church, okay? It's the second letter. And this letter was written just months after the first one. Paul received a report that, hey, there's a little bit of confusion. There might have been a miscommunication. We understand that there's people in the church writing letters in the name of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and they're there creating, uh, you know, they're, they're creating a stir. They're creating fear. There's individuals who think that they might have missed the day of the Lord. They're thinking that their struggle, their persecution, and the troubles that they're experiencing might be them in the last days. It's thinking that they missed the rapture or they missed the second coming of Christ and they're being left uh, to, to endure the hardships of the world. And Paul in Second Thessalonians is trying to ease their concern. And he's like, hey, 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 hold on a second. You didn't miss it. There's some things that have to happen. There's an order of events. There's a system that will take place. There's things that will happen before that day. Up until then, hey, you're dealing with suffering, struggles, persecutions, and issues just like everybody. Everybody will go through them. So, so just know that you're not, you haven't missed the, you haven't missed the cut, right? Um, it says, brothers and sisters, we have something to say about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the time when we will meet together with him. Verse two says, do not be easily upset in your thinking or afraid if you hear that the day of the Lord has already come. Right. He, again, he's trying to ease their concern. Like, don't be concerned. Don't be so easily upset. Don't get your feathers ruffled up so quick because you heard something that wasn't so. He says, someone may say this in a prophecy or in a message or in a letter as if it came from us, right? He's addressing the fact that, hey, people are out here, they're prophesying about it. Oh, the day of the Lord is upon us. Oh, you guys have missed it, right? Like false teachers that ring a bell, right? The the whole, the world's going to end in Y2K. Who remembers Y2K, right? I remember the year 2000, the world was going to end. The internet was going to shut down. Everybody stocked up on batteries and water. Uh, like, I, I don't know the end of the world, like our batteries and water is going to save us. So Y2K came. And I remember when the ball dropped, it was just like pure panic. And, you know, we thought there was going to be this major blackout, right? That was 22 years ago. And then wasn't there like something in 2012? It was like the year of the Mayan calendar and the world was going to end in 2012. And, I mean, we go through these every 10, 15, 20 years, some wacko comes out of the woodworks with this prophecy that God gave them, them, this special message of when the world is going to end. And it gets all of these people, right? we, we call them fear mongers, right? They, they monger fear and typically they're selling something, right? Yeah, if you guys aren't ready, you got to get your bomb shelter. You got to get your, you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with preparedness, right? I love people who are prepared. I love individuals. What are they called? They have these extreme individuals that get these bunkers and they have years of storage and food preppers, right? I think they're called preppers or something like that. They got a special word for them. They have a whole series on A&E about these end time, these doom days, um, you know, doomsdays preppers or something like that. But look, man, you, you ain't, I don't care how deep your bunker is. I don't care how much food you got stored up, bro. You ain't running from the Lord. You're not running from the end times. Yeah, they're preppers. That's what it is. Like at the end of the day, I love your preparation. Okay. I love that for you. <laughs> I think that's amazing. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't care how much canned ham you got. I don't care how much fake peanut butter and powdered milk you've got stored up, bro. Your top ramen ain't going to save you from the second coming. Yeah, your top ramen ain't gonna save you from the, the the Lord, the day of the Lord. So prepare all you want. Um, I love that for you. I think that's amazing and low key. Like, 
make me a bunk, make me a bed. I, I'll come down there with you. I'll kick it, right? Uh, shoot me the Wi-Fi password. We'll still do the coffee and prayer. But uh, at the end of the day, man, you ain't getting around to that. So it says, hey, someone may say this in a prophecy or in a message or a letter as it came from us. Don't let anyone fool you in that way, right? The day of the Lord will not come until the turning away from God happens and the man of evil, who was like the man of lawlessness, who is on his way to hell appears. So I'm not even going to go into a lot of depth here, right? I'm not even going to go into a lot of depth. You guys are reading this. Um, this becomes a stumbling block for a lot of people. A lot of Christians, well-meaning, who I believe are saved and love Jesus, they spend far too much time trying to unravel and unveil who is the man of lawlessness? When is this going to happen? What are the things like they spend far too much time trying to come up with this end date and they completely lose focus. They become more concerned with, about when Jesus is coming than doing what we need to be doing because there's a sense of urgency, right? So there's going to be, look, there's going to be an order of events. There's going to be the man of lawlessness, the man of evil that will come. He's going to go into God's temple. He's going to sit there and say that he's God, right? And he said, I told you when I was with you that this all is going to happen. Do you not remember? It's like, do you guys not remember? I told you there's an order of events. And now you know what is stopping that man of evil right now. He says the secret power of evil is already working in the world. It was working back then and it was working 100 years later and working 1,000 years later and it's still working right now. And you can see that if you are, I mean, even one third of the way awake and have your eyes open, all you have to do is look at social media. We live in a time where good is considered bad and bad is considered good. We live in a, in a, in a time where sex is uh, exploited. Man, they use sex to sell vacuum cleaners. They use sex to sell soup. They use sex to literally sell everything. Everything is over-sexualized. We are constantly bombarded with images of sin. We live in a time where sin is now considered, like we turn a blind eye to it. So we are literally in those times. The evil, it says the secret power of evil is already working. This was written 2,000 years ago. And guess what? It's still at work behind the scenes. He goes, but there is one power. There is one who is stopping that power. We understand that God's got the reins on it. We aren't even living in a time where evil has overcome. There are still laws. There are still rules. There are still protection. And it's only because God has allowed that. God is allowing this floodgate of sin not to be opened up. He is stopping that. But there's going to be a time when he takes his foot off the brake. He's going to allow the floodgates to open. And we're going to be living in a time. We think the time is evil right now. Listen, the very fact that we have access to scripture, the very fact that this live isn't shut down, the very fact that we're able to still say the name of Jesus and we can do this on a live Instagram, uh, it tells us that the floodgates haven't quite been opened all the way. God is still allowed, God has still got his foot on the brake and he hasn't allowed it to come full circle. We understand that he's still protecting us. There's going to be a day when he takes his foot off the brake and it's going to blow wide open. And the day is near. Oh, I'm going to go King James on you. The day, the day is nigh, right? The day is nigh. Because if you pay any attention on what's going on around the world right now, you understand that churches are being burnt to the ground. There are individual, there, there are places where Bibles are being banned. I recently saw two days ago that there are people who are facing charges for quoting scripture when it came to an, uh, an issue of sexual identity. And they're now calling that hate crime because there were two individuals who stood on truth and tweeted scripture when they were going against the argument of sexual identity. This was in a different country. So now because they were using scripture and standing on their faith in opposition of the issue of sexual identity, they're now facing jail charges. This is something that is... Uh, it, it's it's creeping its way into it. And in some areas, it's not even creeping. In some areas, it's completely blatant. But understand that God still has his foot on the brake. We're going to be stepping into a time where it says, hey, he will continue to stop it until he is taken out of the way. He's going to step out of the way. Then the man of evil will appear and the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath that comes from his mouth and will destroy him with the glory of his coming. The, the man of evil will come by the power of Satan. He will have great power and he will do many different false miracles, signs, and wonders. He will use every kind of evil to trick those who are lost. Notice that this is, this is, this is what I want to share. I highlighted this. Verse 10. 
He's going to use every kind of evil. He's going to do miracle signs and wonders. And he's going to trick those who are, fill in the blank, lost. It doesn't say that he's going to trick those who are saved. He's not going to say, it doesn't say he's going to trick those who have the Holy Spirit. He's not going to trick those who know Jesus. Because we have the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us. We are awake. We understand. We can see that. Understand that there are people who are lost and blinded. There are people who don't believe in God. They don't believe in the scripture. So they are going to completely miss the signs. They're going to completely miss the what we talk about. It looks like childbirth, right? There's these birth pains. As, as we get closer, these things become more frequent. They become more intense. And as followers of Jesus, individuals who have the Holy Spirit, we are aware. This man of lawlessness, this man of evil isn't going to somehow show up and trick you out of your salvation, right? So many people, they, they're filled with fear when it comes to talking about the end times, the tribulation. The, they're, the First off, there's a ton of confusion. But second off, people are riddled with fear, thinking that somehow they're going to miss this guy and he's going to completely slide in and, and completely trick you. Look, man, if, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You ain't going to be trickable, right? You're not going to be trickable. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's why there's this emphasis on, listen, I'm going to stay close to God. I'm going to keep my eyes on him. I'm going to pursue holiness and righteousness today. And, and, and when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to choose that again. And the day after that, I'm going to choose that again. And I'm going to take today as if this is the last day that I get. And I'm going to focus on him. I'm not going to open a door. I'm not going to create space for me to compromise or to live in sin. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to choose Christ. And I'm going to focus on him throughout this day. His strength is enough. His peace is enough. His provision is enough. I'm going to make it my mission to stay awake, to stay focused, and to choose holiness and righteousness. And I believe if I stay alert, stay awake, stay in the word, stay in his presence, that I will not have the ability to be tricked, fooled, or my arm twisted into following the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness, right? Please do not let fear consume you when it comes to these end time prophecies, these words, and these directions. Understand that you are a child of God. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Remind yourself, one of my favorite verses, the power that is in you is greater than the power in this world. Yes, the enemy has power in this world, but his power is over those who are lost, who are blinded, who do not have the divine revelation of who Jesus is. His power is over those who do not know the truth. So when it's talking about this, he will use every kind of evil to trick those who are lost. You are not a part of that. Christ left the 99 to find the one he found you. You're no longer lost. You're no longer trickable. It says, look, they will die because they refuse to love the truth. If they loved the truth, they would be saved. Right? For this reason, God sends them something powerful that leads them away from the truth so they will believe a lie. That God's going to allow them to continue. If, if they don't want to spend time with God here, if they don't want to see the truth, if they blatantly ignore it and they don't want to be in his presence, they don't want to believe his truth, they want to believe what they want to believe, then why would they want to go to heaven to spend eternity with him? He's going to allow them to pursue the things of their heart, the things of their flesh. They don't want God. They're in a place where they are not choosing him. They've rejected him. They've had every opportunity to put their trust, their faith, their hope in him, yet they want to pursue their fleshly desires and the lusts of their eyes. They want what they want and God's going to let them have it, right? He's not a God where he's going to twist your arm and force you to love him. You have the choice. So these individuals, he's going to allow them to pursue the very thing that they spent their life pursuing. Amen? So all those will be judged guilty who did not believe the truth, but enjoyed doing evil. Highlight that. They enjoyed doing evil. They didn't love the truth. They didn't love people. They didn't want to turn from it. They chose, They made this decision. That's what they want. And God's such a loving God that he's going to say, okay, that's what you want. That's what you love. That's your heart's desires. And guess what? I'm going to allow you to have those things. The door's open. Go for it. And these people are choosing that. Here's a little bit of uh, here's a little bit of of peace and comfort that'll transcend your mind. It says in verse thirteen, God chose you from the beginning to be saved. You have been chosen. He says you are saved by the Spirit that makes you holy and by your faith in the truth. 
Verse 15, so brothers and sisters, stand strong, continue to believe the teachings we gave you. And uh, in verse 16 and 17, it says, um, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father encourage you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. God loved us. And through his grace, he gave us a good hope and encouragement that continues forever. We have hope. We have encouragement. We have a life. We have peace. We have comfort. Please do not be deceived. Please do not be discouraged. Please do not be riddled with fear, right? Please do not be riddled with fear. Please do not allow the enemy to steal your joy. It says that he, the enemy roams around. He's like a roaring lion and looking to kill, steal, and destroy, um, Understand that many times the thing that he's trying to kill, still, and destroy is your faith. He's trying to kill your faith. He's trying to destroy your belief, right? He's trying to steal your joy. He doesn't want you to know who you are in Christ. He doesn't want you walking in your identity. He's trying to steal your identity. He's trying to kill you and remind, he's trying to kill the spirit in you and remind you of who you were. He wants you walking in your flesh. He wants you walking in your past. He wants you walking in your excuses. He wants you walking in your discouragement. He wants you walking in defeat. He doesn't want you to understand who you are and what Jesus did, right? He doesn't want you to know that. God is good and faithful and we truly have nothing to fear. Scripture says God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He did not give us a spirit of fear. So if you are riddled with fear, the spirit that you are wrestling with is not from God. Amen. Come on. It says the Bible is clear. The Lord steps in and snatches believers out. He takes care of us, man. He's got us. Amen. Let me get some of this coffee and we're going to jump into Proverbs 27. The word of truth. Scripture brings the truth. And that's where we are to stand. I would encourage you guys to do further research. I mean, in everything that we read, every time that we devote time, energy, and effort to knowing Scripture, if you have questions, go deeper. Utilize your favorite search engine. One of my favorite... Uh, one of my favorite commentaries that I use is called Bible Ref. Bible, R-E-F. And the Ref stands for, it's short for reference, BibleRef.com. And you go in there and it not only gives you the chapter, but it gives you a really easy to follow play-by-play. -play. You can go deeper. There's some that are a lot more intricate that I like to use. There's Blue Letter. There's, um, there's, uh, Bible.com. There's a lot of different places where you can find context and commentary, but the one that I started out with was Bible Ref, Bible R E F. And when you go in there, you know, you type in the verse or even the chapter, and it gives you some historical context. It gives you the author, the time. It gives you like the audience that he was speaking to. It gives you these different food for thought and it breaks scripture down and it's very easy to read. So um, as a tool and as you guys are being discipled, when you have questions, uh, you know, use your search engine of choice, but find Bible ref and, and put in the scripture and see what it brings up. It's super helpful, right? It's super helpful. Uh, the question, how do I remove the spirit of fear? Um, it's not something for, for you, you walk in the spirit of truth. So when fear comes up, you stand on truth. So what are you fearful of is the question. So when fear, you don't have to answer that. So when fear rises up, I run to scripture. Maybe the fear is being alone and there's this fear. Oh man, you're going to be alone. I'm scared. I don't want to be alone. What does the truth say? The opposite. Because fear is established from a lie. Right, All of these spirits that we think that we have, which we don't, the only spirit that we have is the Holy Spirit. These spirits that rise up against truth, we must call them by name and we must grab the opposite of what they're speaking and stand on it. So if the fear says that you're alone, you have this fear of being alone, you run to scripture and you find the opposite, the truth. Oh, weird. It says that I will never, that God will never leave me nor forsake me. So the spirit of fear is rooted in loneliness, yet the Bible and the truth says I'll never be alone. There's the truth. You stand on it. Uh, maybe the, maybe it says that, oh, uh, you know, 
Your fear is that you won't be forgiven or that your sins were too great. Okay, so now that's rooted in a lie and the lie is that, you know, you're, you're, you're not saved. So now you find truth that says, oh, scripture says that my sins are as far as the east is from the west. Scripture says, truth says that my sins have been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness, right? Scripture says that uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so, right? So I start standing on truth. And it refutes the lie. And so fear no longer lives here. It no longer has a place because I'm not allowing it to have a place because I'm standing on truth. All of your fear, your worry, your concerns, they're all rooted in a lie. Understand that the devil is the father of lies. He's the father of lies. He uses fear. He, I mean, he uses lies. He uses accusation and he uses division. He uses a lot of things, but he loves accusation, lies being the father of lies and the accuser of the brethren. And he loves to divide. So when he uses these tactics to encourage you to fear, to worry, to concern, to, uh, to overthink all of these things, they're rooted typically in lie and deception. And you battle that with truth. That's why Ephesians 6 says, this is our sword. This is our sword. So we step into this battle, this arena, this spiritual warfare, and we take our sword and we slice down the lies of the enemy because this is truth, right? I believe that it's, it's, it's simpler than we like to make. And, and we give the enemy so much power. You know, oh, he's got a spirit of fear. And it's like, there's this spirit of fear and it's coming against us. But when you go, time out. Hold on a second. The power in me is greater than the power in this world. Fear has no power over me. Hold on a second. The Holy Spirit dwells within me. Wow. I'm more than a conqueror. I've been chosen and set aside. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a child of God. When I start to understand who I am, not because of what I've done or because I'm some special individual, it's because I've put my faith in Jesus. God says that he now sees, excuse me, he sees me as the perfection and the righteousness of Christ. The Holy Spirit that dwells in me, now I have the resurrection, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave dwells in me. So now when the enemy rises up in fear, concern, worry, any of those things, now I say, oh, no, 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 no. I resist you and you must flee. You have no authority in this place. It boils down to knowing who you are, the, the weapons that you possess, and you start walking in it. That's what the enemy wants is he wants you blind. He doesn't want you to know who you are. He's attacking. He's trying to kill, steal, and destroy your identity and your power and the truth. He don't want you to walk in it because when you start walking in it, you start walking different. None of those things have authority over you. Chapter 27 of Proverbs. Um, I got a handful that I want to share. I won't take too much time. Uh, verse one, verse one, boast not thyself of tomorrow for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Um, I love this verse. Let's, let's, you know, so many of us just kind of like I was talking about earlier in my, one of my favorite movies, click, uh, people are constantly focused on tomorrow. They're focused on their tomorrows and their achievements and their accolades. And on this day, I'm going to this event and I'm doing this. I love that. It's okay to have a goal. It's okay to have a calendar. It's okay to make plans. But we understand that man will make plans, but God will establish the steps. There very well may be things that you plan in your tomorrow and that you're boasting in and you're excited about that never take place. Have any of you ever, and I, I've done this, man, and it's it, it sucks. Um, oh yeah, you know what, man, in August, I'm, I'm going on this trip, you know, I'm going to go to Barbados, not really, but I'm, I'm just throwing out now. I'm going to go to Barbados and then we're going to head over to Dubai and then we're going to do, you know, we're going to jump on some camels and we're going to go through Egypt. It's going to be an amazing time. And I spend all of this time. Oh yeah, I'm going here. I'm doing here. And so I'm spending all of this time building it up and I'm telling everybody about it. I'm just like, you know, it's going to be awesome. And then August comes around and my plans fall through. God has a different direction that he's taking me for my life. And then August comes around. Around. I've spent all of this time building up this suspense and people are like, oh, I thought you were going to Egypt. Well, then you got to explain yourself and you got to eat crow and you got to pull your foot out of your mouth because you were so focused on your tomorrows that you weren't seeing that God was doing something different today. So it, it's one of those humbling things. I try not to share too much about my tomorrows and I focus on my today because I don't know what tomorrow holds. I have a lot of plans. I've got a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes. There's a lot of things that I want to do, but I've learned early on that I need to stay focused on the present moment, make those plans, write those dreams out, have those vision boards and goals, but stay so in tune with God that he might be doing something different and his plan might not line up with your plan, 
but I don't know about you, but I want his plan over my plan. So if my things don't fall through, I don't have to go back and retract all of these statements and eat crow and explain myself and this and that. I'm going to keep it to myself. I'm going to stay focused on today. So it says, this is scripture. This ain't even my opinion. Hey, boast not yourself of tomorrow for you don't even know what a day may bring forth. Right? Stay focused on today. Stay locked in here. Don't worry about tomorrow. It's okay to have plans. It's okay. But you know, many times I keep them to myself until they are happening or I'm right in the moment of it. You know what I mean? Or at least I try to. I try to hold the excitement and not put too much out there. Um, mm, this is good. We've shared this before. Verse six, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right? Mm. I'd much rather have people around me who love me and will tell me the truth and keep me from getting myself hurt than being surrounded by a bunch of yes men, a bunch of people who just tell me what I want to hear, who hype me up. And you see this, man. You see this. The first person that comes to mind, right, is uh, Floyd Money Mayweather, right? Uh, I, I think of these celebrities or these athletes who they surround themselves with hype men and, and yes men and individuals who are just there to you know really boost their ego and make them feel good about themselves. And, and, and honestly, many times those people are there for the clout or the fame or the influence and they're there just saying, yeah, 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 that's a great idea when really it's a horrible decision. You have these people who are surrounded by you, um, you know, and, and they're, they're kissing, they're kissing your butt right? They're elevating you. They're basically worshiping you because you are affecting their bottom line. You're putting them on. You're helping them live a lifestyle and live out a dream that they couldn't have done on their own. And so they're surrounding you and they're flocking to you because, you know, as long as you keep telling them yes and not giving them sound counsel, they're going to keep you around. But the moment when you stand up and you start to speak truth or you start to confront them or challenge the way that they're living or thinking, they want to dismiss you. I'd much rather have a few friends around me who will call me on my crap and and make sure that I'm living a life that is uh, filled with integrity, discipline, consistency, and is actually walking out the way that I want than people around me who are just hyping me up all the time. I don't want to be hyped up. I don't need hype men. I, I, I'm, I'm bad enough on my own. I make a lot of decisions very poor, right? Very poor on my own. I need people who are in touch with reality, who have uh, a, a sense of identity. And, you know, I want people who are submitted to Christ in my circle, close friends who are willing to offend me, right? I'd rather have my friends offend me off of a, a path of destruction than to hype me up and encourage me down a path that leads to my failure, right? And that's scripture, man. The wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That's what I got out of it. That's what really spoke to me. Um, verse eight, <clears throat> as a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. Right? I think I get this little picture of a baby bird that's in its nest and, you know, it, it wanders off from the protection of its mama and, you know, it might, might, you know, maybe it didn't even fall off a tree, but it wanders off. And when it's away from its nest, there's no protection. And now this little baby bird is subject to these big, bad nutrients or squirrels or, you know, these predators and prey because they're no longer in their place of protection. And when I read that, it's almost like a man that wanders from his home, a, a man that wanders away from uh, his place. <clears throat> And I get a picture of like a man who, you know, he has a home, he's got his wife, he's got his kids, he's got, uh, you know, he's got a life that God has established and put him in this place. But because of the lust of his eyes and the lust of his flesh, he wanders away from the home. And this doesn't have to be men. It could be women as well. They, they wander away from the place that God has them. And when they do so, they're putting themselves out there in a place where they're vulnerable and they're not protected and they don't have the covering of the people in their life who truly love them and care about them. They're there to protect them. And God puts things in place so that they're covered and overshadowed. But when they wander away from that place, they leave themselves open to spiritual attack. They leave themselves open and vulnerable to uh, the people in this world who don't necessarily have the greatest intentions for them, right? It's kind of a uh, something, It just that's just what popped up on my heart. Man, squirrels are, squirrels are savage, man. Don't look, Henry, you laugh at squirrels, man. I've seen some savage squirrels. I've seen some squirrels get into it, man. You don't know what they're going to do. A squirrel might get a baby bird. might hurt it. You don't even know. You don't even know. 
I literally don't even know. I said squirrels, but I'm trying to think of like these apex predators that you see in the the trees. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's an owl. I don't know. I don't know. Moving forward. Verse 17. We all know this one. This is a great one. Iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpened the countenance of his friend. Um, and I, I speak because yesterday was dude's day. You guys, it was dude's day. It's a new day of the week. If you don't know it, it goes Sunday, Monday, dude's day. And then there's Wednesday. We love Wednesday, but Tuesday is dude's day. And <clears throat> we got to be around a bunch of brothers who are literally running in the same direction. And we're all sharpening each other's swords. We're sharpening each other's countenance. Um, there were messages. There were things that people said that sharpened me. Brother DeAndre, who's on here, Brother Scott, Brother Jeremy, they all shared things. And uh, Brother Matt, there, there was everybody shares. Brother Charles, there's all these guys on there who share something. And I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm sitting there just going, oh, that's good. And I'm being fed and I'm being challenged and I'm being shaped and we're sharpening each other. And I'm saying things that are sparking fire in their lives and vice versa. And it's just this beautiful thing. And so I mean, that's what we are called to do <clears throat> as the body of Christ. I need to get some water up in here. Hold on a second. Dude's day. You guys see, it's a thing. It is a thing. Is Wednesday Women's Day? Look, I can't speak on it. You guys got to come up with your own day. You guys got to stop looking to me for Women's Day. I need you guys to have a movement on your own. I can only account for dude's day. That's my thing, right? It's dude's day. Ladies, y'all got to figure it out. You guys got to figure it out and, and figure something out on your own, All right? That's funny. And you guys can't, you can't put that on my wife. She's busy already. She's got a lot on her plate. When I was like, yo, you should do a women's group. That didn't work out. That didn't work out. She is busy, okay? It'll come. Yeah, you guys do need a women's day. Dude's day. So, We'll move forward. A couple more. Verse 18. Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. Oh, man. Water your own grass. And when you do so, when you take care of the fig tree that you have, when you water the grass that you have, it's going to bear fruit. It's going to be greener. The grass is greener where you water it. It's easy to be in a marriage and look out at single people and go, man, they're really living the life. But at the same time, those single people are looking at all those who are married and go, man, they're really living the life, all right? When there is a, a season, when there is a blessing, when there is uh, you know, something that God is trying to develop in your life in the season that you're in, the grass is greener where you water it. The figs, right? Whoso keepeth the fig trees will eat the fruit thereof. Take care of what God has given you. This spoke to me, and this was the last part that I read this morning before I went into prayer. Um, why is many of us want a bigger tree? We, want a, we, we got a fig tree, but we're looking for an orange tree, or we're looking for an apple tree, or we're looking for a pine tree. We're looking for, we're, we're looking for a coconut tree, right? A palm tree. We're looking for these trees that are greater than the ones that we have, but we don't take care of the trees that are in our yard now right? We're not taking care of the trees that we have. We're not being good stewards of what God has already given us. We want platforms. We want ministry. We want clout. We want influence. We want money. We want relationship, but we can't even take care of the things that God has given us in the moment, right? We want these ministries that span the world. Like some of them, that's what you want. Maybe you want to have hundreds of thousands of followers, but you can't even minister to the three people in your life right now. Why would God give you more when you're not faithful with what you have? right? Some of you want these relationships. You want these godly spouses. You want these marriages, but you don't even have a relationship with Jesus that's consistent. Why would he give you more, right? If you can't communicate with God, you can't get to know him by reading the scripture and you can't spend time alone with him, the one who loves you the absolute most, why is he going to give you his precious daughter or son? Why would he put them into your grips when you're still toxic, when you're still healing, you're not whole, you're not healthy, but yet you're sitting here asking God for this spouse. You can't, you're not even faithful with the mental health that he's given you. Why is he going to put somebody else's mental health in your hands? I'm going to take a sip on that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Some of us, you 
right? We got so much baggage and issues and there's so much hate and unforgiveness and resentment and there's so many things that God's dealing with us now yet we're begging him for somebody to come into our life. Why would he add somebody into that mess that you've got? You got to do some house cleaning. You got to clean it up. There's some things that you need to prune your fig tree, right? You might need to uproot it and replant it. But, but we're sitting here asking God for more. And let's take relationships out of it. Some of you guys are asking for a financial blessing, but you don't take care of the money that you got. You're, you're blowing it and spending it on things that don't necessarily get you to where you want to go. You're making poor investments. You're more concerned with materials, clothes, things, items, and experiences. You're not even, you don't even have a faithful tithe set up. You're not even, in, and, and maybe just take tithe out of it. You're not even investing your money into people or to, you, you're, you're, you're being blessed to bless yourself. You're not being a, ble- you're not being blessed to be a blessing. Why is God going to continue to give you more when you're not faithful with what you got? I'll move on. Last one I'm going to share. Verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. That spoke to me. um, And I'm going to close with that is our, our, our appetites are insatiable when it comes to the flesh, right? When we are operating out of the spirit, we're not in tune with God. We're not in alignment with uh, the Holy Spirit. We're not doing what God has called us to do. Our appetites are insatiable. Our appetite for sex is insatiable. Our appetite for, um, for, for love is insatiable. Our appetite for things is insatiable. We're never satisfied. And just when you think you're satisfied, you get what you think that you wanted, a brand new appetite opens up. You want more. You want more. Has anybody ever lived? Like I can sit here and speak from experience. I've lived a life in this world where I was pursuing uh, all of my appetites, the things that I believed were going to bring me peace, joy, happiness, and satisfaction. I chased after fitness and my goal and mission was to have an amazing body. And I achieved that. My mission and goal was to achieve a lot of money or to, to earn a lot of money. And I did that. My goal and my appetite was to have a lot of things and materials. And I did that. Uh, my, my appetite was to have have achievements and accolades and awards to hang up on the wall so that I could pat myself on the back. And I achieved those things. And without fail, right, there was this process of grinding and going after and chasing after what I got. But once I received it, what did I want? I wanted more, right? Have, have you, any of you ever wanted something so bad and when you got it, you just were like, it, it didn't satisfy? I remember shoes like that, waiting and, and, and could, you know, I was saving money and getting, you know, buying this expensive pair of shoes that I just knew was going to complete my collection. And once I got those shoes, I wasn't satisfied. I couldn't wait for the next drop, the next shoe to come out or a vacation. I couldn't wait to get vacation. And as soon as I got done with the vacation, I was already looking and planning my next vacation because it didn't satisfy. Our appetites are insatiable. They're insatiable. And it's not until we start living by the spirit and understanding the only thing that will satisfy is Jesus. Over and over and over again, Jesus will satisfy. Jesus will fill that God-shaped hole that's in your heart. It's Jesus and it's only Jesus. It's always been and it will always only be. It's Jesus. It's him. It's him. And until we wrap our mind around that and, and make him first in every aspect of our life, there's no money, there's no spouse, there's no experience, there's no material that will ever satisfy. And it's all in him. It's only through him. It's only by him. It's all for him. The goal is Christ. The goal is Christ. It's all about him. And when we shift our perspective and start to see through that lens that it's all Christ, it's all about him, then and only then does the healing start to take place. The healing in your relationships, the healing in your personal life, the healing in your finances, the healing in your physical health, the healing in every aspect, all of these things that we're praying for, right? Uh, I've, I've talked about this before. We're all praying for God to change things in our lives. God, change my finances. God, change my spouse. God, change my health. God, change the results. God, I'm praying over the exam results. Like I'm praying over this test. I'm pray- God, change these things. But God's more concerned with changing you than he is your circumstances. Many of the times our prayer should be, God, change me. Change my heart, right? 
I'm asking for you to change the results to this test. No, God, change my study habits. <laughs> Like, you know, I get so many people, God, will you pray over my test? No, I'm going to pray that you would spend more time studying than being in my DMs asking me for you to pray for the results of your test, right? And I'm not talking like a health test. People are praying over, oh, I'm taking my SATs or this and that. Uh-uh, get out of my DMs and get back in your study book. I'm going to pray over your, your, your studiousness. I'm praying that God changes you and that you're not throwing a Hail Mary hoping that prayer changes the results to your test, Right? Many of us, oh, will, will you pray, you know, pray that I get in better shape? No, I'm going to pray that you would change your consistency and your discipline. I'm going to pray that God changes you and the way that you view exercise and fitness and the way that you eat. I'm going to pray that you change the way that you view yourself, right? I want to, ch I'm praying that God would change you, not your circumstances, because when God changes us, our circumstances change, right? When God changes us, our circumstances change. And if they don't change the way we view them does. So the things that we once saw as an obstacle or an issue or this insurmountable issue, as God changes us, we start to see them as opportunities to now be refined, changed, challenged, and to be more like Christ. So, so my prayer isn't for God to change my circumstances. My prayer is that God would change me in the way that I view them. Because when I start to view my the circumstances and the things going on in my life through the same lens that Jesus views them, I stop seeing these insurmountable issues and I start seeing opportunities for me to be challenged, changed, and more like Jesus in those situations. Right? Amen. Change me. And I got all of that out of this, right? How did we get there? Lord have mercy. That's Holy Spirit. Uh, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. We got there by talking about never being satisfied, never being happy, never being full. And the only thing that satisfies is Christ. The only thing that satisfies is Christ. Amen. That's a great place to stop right there. I think we're good. I think we're complete. Uh, tomorrow, we're jumping into... 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll read Proverbs chapter 28 as well. Again, you guys are reading this on your own. This is not story time with Pastor Carter. You guys are exhibiting your own discipline, your own consistency. You guys are showing up and you guys are devoting your time, energy, and effort to knowing the scripture yourself. All that I'm doing is I'm coming here and I'm providing some uh, comical relief, right? I'm providing some food for thought. And a little bit of context, right? So that we better understand the scripture. We have a deeper knowledge of who he is. And we leave here all a little bit changed, a little bit transformed. And, uh, you know, filled with a little bit of joy and laughter. Because sometimes the things that we say and do on here is hilarious, right? Amen. I love it. So um, let's pray. Uh, my, my, my faith and fitness group. We have a live Zoom tonight at 6 p.m. I can't wait to see you guys. So um, the link is on Faithful. It's also in our Slack group. If you guys have been like, oh, I want to do faith and fitness, we're going to start a brand new sign up tomorrow. I want to get everything ironed out with the people that I have in the group today. I want to make sure that all their questions are answered. They're all on the right track. And we, we, we kind of get these finite details locked in. And for those of you who are interested, um, I will post the sign up stuff for a later date, right? Amen. Let's pray. So um, somebody asked, can we please repeat the scripture? Uh, it's at the bottom of the screen, right down there. It's pinned. It will always be pinned right down there. First Jesus, then coffee, pinned. And may put 2 Thessalonians 2 and Proverbs 27, a cute little coffee emoji, plus sign and prayer hands. It will always be down there. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. Lord, we are so grateful. We are absolutely honored that you would meet us in this place. Lord, we lay down our fears, our worries, our concerns. We lay down all of the things that have us weighed down, feeling like our back is against the wall. We put our hope, our faith, and our trust in you because we know that you are good, that you are faithful, that you are loving, that you are for us. We understand that you are our protector. We understand that no weapon formed against us will prosper because we are yours. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would lead us 
and guide us. We come against any attack from the enemy. We understand that we are in a spiritual war. There are forces in dark places that are looking to oppress us, that are looking to discourage us, and that are trying to keep us bound in fear. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we reject those things. We stand on truth. We rise up as more than conquerors because that is what scripture says that we are. We resist the enemy and we know that he must flee from us. Right now we are standing on biblical truth and and, and biblical principles, knowing that they will not be bent, twisted, or manipulated. These are our foundation, God. Help us to build our lives on the foundation of your truth and of your word. Help us to walk in the boldness, the courage, and the authority that we have because of what Jesus did. It's not by our strength, Lord, but by yours. Allow us to be vessels for your Holy Spirit. And as we go out into this day, God, we pray that you would present us opportunities to share the good news with those who are lost, hurt, burdened, and are uh, in a place where they have no hope. God, help us to be light bearers, lights of this world and salt of the earth for the name of Jesus. And we pray this in his mighty name. Amen and amen. I pray that you guys have an amazing day. I love you. I honor you. And until tomorrow, stay blessed. We'll see you guys later.